he overdosed on fentanyl. Jonathan Singh spoke with the district attorney's office and upstate poison control on the dangers of fentanyl and the charges the couple is now facing. Jonathan's live in downtown Syracuse tonight with the latest. Jonathan. Matt, it's a second degree manslaughter charge that could put both the mother and her boyfriend in jail for over a dozen years if they're found guilty after their little boy, Liam, who was just 11 months old, passed away from a fentanyl overdose that was back in May. Here's the house on West Fayette Street, not too far from Tip Hill, where Liam Sove overdosed on fentanyl. The baby boy was just 11 months old. Court documents say that the narcotic was in the house, but it's unclear if the adults gave it to Liam or if he ingested it himself. Whether they gave it to him to, you know, get him to sleep or calm down, or the child, um, being 11 months, could have potentially gotten a hold of it himself. Um, it's just they're charged with recklessly causing his death based upon bringing those um, narcotic drugs into the residence and allowing it to end up in the child's body. As for the adults, the mother, 31-year-old Elizabeth Sove and her boyfriend Quinn Hoon are now facing manslaughter charges. The couple was charged with manslaughter as opposed to murder because the court believes they did not intend to kill Liam. Tragic. It's horrific that a, a baby this young um, in his own home that his death was caused by the actions of the people that are supposed to be taking care of him. As of now, it's unclear if the couple was prescribed fentanyl for a medical condition. Upstate Poison Control says if that's the case, then the drug should have been stored away in a safe spot. So we really emphasize that all opioids should be put in a lockbox and up and away and out of reach of children. And we're also told that this is not the first time that Upstate Poison Control has heard of a young child dying from opioids and other drugs. Court documents say that Liam was pronounced dead at the hospital, and right now there is no word on if he could have been revived with Norcan. We're very, very conservative. Very, very, I mean, if a child, we get a phone call and it's a little kid that gets into an opioid, we immediately send them into an emergency room. They need to be checked, monitored, watched. Authorities say they were not sure what killed the 11-month-old Liam. They did the autopsy report and found out that it was, in fact, a fentanyl overdose. New tonight, leaders of a Syracuse nonprofit continue to refuse interview requests and are saying nothing about any changes in leadership. This comes as the Department of Justice begins its investigation into Vera House, an investigation that could cost the organization more than $1 million in grant funding. Investigative reporter Mary Keeler explains. Three weeks after our news team first reported on Vera House's hiring of a registered sex offender, legal consequences are now becoming a reality. The organization's mission is helping victims and survivors of domestic and sexual abuse. But New York State's Office of Victim Services now reports that level two offender convicted of sex crimes against children came into contact with children at least twice during his work with Vera House. That's now costing Vera House more than six $64,000 in funding used to pay Jackson over the past two years. Vera House's most detailed response came last Thursday in a two-page statement that blamed both Jackson and the agency hired to conduct background checks. That agency, run by former Syracuse Police Chief Frank Fowler, fired by Vera House, but also firing back days later in this interview with CNY Central. Fowler saying Vera House never asked to know more about Jackson's criminal past that later came to light in our reporting. They never asked for anything in addition to that. The first thing I heard about Vera House and an issue with the person in question was I saw, saw it on the news just like everyone else. I waited a couple days with hopes that Vera House would contact me and then I saw a second article. When I saw the second article, I sent Vera House an email indicating that we will no longer conduct background checks for them. So when they issued their statement to say that they weren't, that they were no longer going to use us, well, they were absolutely correct because guess why? I told them that we weren't doing a background check for them anymore. The lengthy statement from Vera House's co-executive directors makes four apologies. It mentions trust, transparency, accountability, and responsibility a total of 10 times. But victims, survivors, past clients, and former employees leaving the organization over its handling of this matter continue to turn to CNY Central demanding accountability.
There was no regret expressed of the hiring decision. No. More than one week after the lengthy response from Vera House, dozens of new questions for that group's leadership team continue to go unanswered, including... One, the statement from the co-executive directors says staff had no role in Marcus Jackson's hiring. So we want to know, was this an active agency secret? Two, were there any discussions internally or with Jackson directly about why he wanted to be in a role as a victim advocate? Three, if Vera House is hiring an outside HR consultant to review hiring and personnel now, what role did the organization's HR team have in his hiring to begin with? And four, did Vera House look to their own lawyer for advice and guidance when making this hire? Mary Keeler's unfolding what you need to know if you're a healthcare consumer, a patient at one of these practices. She joins us now with more. Mary? A ransomware attack on medical billing company Practice Resources LLC is impacting more than 920,000 people throughout the central New York region. The company serves all Syracuse's hospitals and many doctor's offices. Are you impacted by this? Here's what you should do. If you're one of the thousands of patients that opened up a letter like this from Practice Resources, the company says that means your name, address, and medical records could have been compromised by hackers. The medical billing company says they've sent out notices to 924,138 patients. There are more than two dozen medical groups on the list, including Upstate, Krauss, and St. Joe's. Community Hospital, Lab Alliance, and Syracuse Pediatrics are among other that had information compromised. The letter patients receive shares more about what happened and how you can protect yourself from identity theft and fraud and will come from this address from Practice Resources LLC. PRL is also offering credit monitoring services free to anyone impacted by the breach. You have until November 30th to register for that free credit monitoring service. And in the letter you get, there will be an access code to help you sign up. We've got a link to get you started on cnycentral.com, as well as a full list of impacted medical groups.